folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri, and head of Prophetic Research Ministry with another Watchman video broadcast. I'm going to, or the Lord is going to reveal some more secrets today, some, some more mysteries, things that, oh, let's say things that the devil doesn't want you to know about, things that, you know, certain evil men in this world don't want you to know about. And as I was putting together all of this information, there's, in fact, I want to turn here uh, right off the bat. I've got a lot of scriptures and a lot of things to show you today. Um, we're going to uncover a mystery, something that uh, there are probably a billion people on this world that are involved in this, maybe more, I don't know. They don't understand the mystery, and I think God wants mysteries revealed. Uh, I will admit to you that... Um, some of the information that I'm going to share with you came from one of our watchers in Canada. Oh, Canada. Um, he, we've had several good conversations. Anyway, he passed this along to me and I went, oh, I get it. I know what that means. Um, one of the things that God has done uh, with this ministry, with me in particular, he has he sort of let me see and understand symbols, things. Uh, and it really, it really started out with I, I walked by a, a bookshelf in our church library one day, little little bitty church library, and I saw this and I went, What is that symbol on this on this new King James version of the Bible? What is that? I I looked at that and I said, well, I, I, I don't understand that. I, I want to know what this means. I, I've never said we didn't have that in our church anywhere. And so that sort of put, gave me an interest in studying symbols. I read uh, the Da Vinci Code, and that just kind of egged it on. And I got into morals and dogma and secret teachings of all ages and Dan Brown stuff and, and national treasure and everything. I started studying symbols. And I began to understand the biblical meaning of symbols. And let me explain, let me explain symbology, a sim, symbology. Let me explain that for a minute. The whole idea behind using symbols is that you can, and some people say, well, you know, symbol means whatever you want it to mean. That's, that's the point. That's the point of, of using a symbol. Um, I think it was Albert Pike said morals and dogma. He said, we use symbols, and we tell all the little guys down here what it means, but we're not really telling the truth. All of us big dogs at the top, and Albert Pike was pretty big, kind of like me. Um, he said, now we know the real meaning of it. And I suspect that Albert Pike didn't know what it is that you and I know, because Albert Pike didn't really believe that the Bible was the inerrant, infallible, and only Word of God. He believed it was like a mystery book with all these other mystery books in it. Anyway, guy from Canada sent me this. I saw it, and I immediately knew it, what it was. He had been watching our broadcast and uh, studying symbols and studying things out of the Bible, and he knew what it meant. And when I saw it, I'm going, you know, I think I'm going to tell the world what's going on. Let's, let's reveal a mystery. Let's reveal a secret and understand something. Understand that, and let me read this out of Ecclesiastes here. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The Bible says, One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and that hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuit. See, Solomon knew that the earth wasn't flat. Uh, he knew it was round. And um, he says, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full unto the place from whence the rivers come. Thither they return again. We featured that in our Cycles of Christian Growth video. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. And then he said in verse 9, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Now that is a sort of a basis for Bible typology. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And he's reiterating the wisdom that came out of Solomon, the preacher, in the book of Ecclesiastes. So he says, there really is no such thing as a new religion or a unique religion. They all teach or all point to the same 
God. Pastor Mike, you're not saying that, are you? Yeah, I am. There's one exception, and that is true Bible Christianity does not point to the same God. But Buddhism, Catholicism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnessism, Sufism, um, you name it, they all point to New Ageism, they all point to the same God, which is Lucifer, including the religion of Islam. And Islam was to me was always a it it, it was a mystery. Um, I couldn't figure it out. You know, they have this Koran. By the way, by the way, I got to throw this in here. Uh, uh, I think it was General Petraeus last week came out and uh, and said, uh, "Oh, that's uh, you know, we we shouldn't be burning the Koran because we're going to offend all of these Muslims and it's it's putting our men in danger and all of this and that and the other." And um, then there was a, uh, I think there was a, something on N- MSNBC or CNN or something like that where a reporter was talking to someone about that and said, you know, uh, why is it wrong to burn the Koran? And the, and the guy answering said, and you get this, and he said, why is, it, why is it wrong to burn the Koran and it's okay to burn the Bible? The guy he was interviewing said this. He said, well, even all, ever, all the Christians know Um, that God didn't write the Bible. Men wrote the Bible, and all the Christians, they don't have a problem with that. Well, let's say most of the Christians don't have a problem with that. I have a problem with that. But anyway, he said everybody knows that God did not write the Bible. Only men wrote the Bible, and yet Muslims believe that God wrote the Koran. Therefore, it is sacred and holy, and it would be a terrible thing to do that. You see how topsy-turvy this world is? But anyway... The, the the religion of Islam I didn't get I kept thinking what uh, you you go to the uh, you go to the what, what is it the uh, the Muslim worship place and and you learn how to blow up buildings and kill people is that is that what is that what your religion is oh no it's a religion of peace no not really not not really um, so I didn't understand it and I wasn't about to sit down and learn Aramaic and then read the Quran from front to back and study the life of the the Prophet Muhammad. I I wasn't going to do that. To me, I like for things to be simple. So a guy sends me a couple of pictures and he says, do you get it? And in just 1.5 seconds, I understand the religion of Islam. And I'm going to I'm going to kind of stair step our way to this. We're going to follow the scriptures. Understand that there is no new thing under the sun. Islam is not a unique religion. We're going to focus not on all the general teachings of Islam and this and that and the other. We're going to focus on what it is that they focus on five times a day. Five. I want you to think about that. Five times a day every Muslim in the world puts their focus toward one thing. It's a city called Mecca. But it's not just the city of Mecca. It's what is the central part of Mecca. That's where they're all pointed toward. All the Muslims in the world are facing and leading in the direction of this one God. And we're going to understand that. We're going to understand the mystery of of Mecca. What 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 is it that is so secretive and so powerful there that these people by duty, by religious ritual, uh, their claim to salvation is based upon this. Five times a day they must stop, drop and roll and pray toward Mecca. What is it that they're praying to and why why is this so powerful amongst them? We're going we're gonna to show you the mystery. I, I love it when every time in the Bible the word mystery. But Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I show you a mystery. He didn't just say, Behold, I know a mystery. He said, I'm going to show it to you. So we're going to look at, and we, we've kind of done a study, different things. I've preached on the mystery of God, how God revealed, God wants his mysteries revealed, and God wants whatever the devil is trying to keep secret in these old secret mystical books I have over here, whatever he's trying to keep secret, God says, I'm, I'm going to reveal it. I'm going to show everybody. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Here's what the Bible says, verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity 
doth already work. That would be the exact opposite of the mystery of godliness. The mystery of iniquity, that is a reference to the Antichrist, doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked, capital W, it's actually a person, then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. You go read Revelation 19. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Now notice verse 11, and this is interesting to me because the number 11 is always the number for confusion, for disorientation, for chaos. Remember that word. So in verse 11, God says, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So here we have the, the understanding that the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, that wicked, the beast, 666, we understand that there is a mystery associated with him. A mystery, watch this now, a mystery that God wants to reveal. But it's a mystery that somebody wants to keep secret. Somebody wants to keep hidden. What spirit would it then be that wants to hide or conceal and not reveal this mystery? What is it? And what is that veil that is covering that? What, what is that? Let's go to Revelation. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna see something today that you've probably never seen before. Revelation chapter 7 verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. That's the beast of Revelation 13, the man of sin, the son of perdition. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, 13 words here, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. So, And, I, and I've taught about this, and I, and I know I'm probably going back over some information that we have shared. But I'm bringing it in in sort of a new light and pointing it in a new direction so that we could understand exactly what it is that's being kept secret from, let's say, over a billion Muslims in this world. What is it that's being hidden? What, what is it that she doesn't want everybody to know. And yet when you understand the language of symbols and when you understand that this Bible has the answer to everything, then we, we don't have to study all the in-depth ideas of, of uh, Islam and all the branches and all that. We don't have to do that. We understand from the Bible exactly what's going on. Mystery Babylon is keeping the secret of the mystery of iniquity. She is the one that is, is covering and, and veiling everything and not wanting anyone to discover or find it out. Because, let I me mean, stop and think about it. We understand that Roman Catholicism, they don't really worship the real Jesus Christ. How do we know? Because he's a statue to them. And so he is the idol, I-D-O-L, shepherd in Roman Catholicism. So if they're not worshiping the real Jesus, then they're worshiping the fake Jesus. Another Jesus that Paul warned about. Antichrist that John said. It wouldn't sit well for a billion Roman Catholics in this world to have revealed to them that they're not worshiping the right Jesus. It wouldn't, I mean, it wouldn't. Number one, it would, you know, it would be bad. It would, you know, not look good. And number two, the Roman Catholic Church would lose all that good money that they've got held up, uh, which they're, you know, paying out in lawsuits here nowadays. 
And so anyway, it, it just wouldn't be good. And so <clears throat> Mystery Babylon, she loves the gold, she loves the silver, she loves the tapestry, she loves the, she loves the beauty of herself. And she's always going to try to conceal what she's really all about and conceal what's going on underneath. She's always going to try to conceal that to hold on to her power. That is her power base. The idea that things are a mystery. And here again, let's, let's pick on Roman Catholicism again. Roman Catholicism's power base is the fact that the priesthood only has the right to A, interpret the Bible, B, even in some cases, read the Bible. They tolerate translations of the Bible that they approve, but the truth of it is they tell them, we will tell you what to believe. Their power base comes in knowing all of your sins through their confessional. Their power base comes through the idea that they say, unless what you do for God is done inside the mother church, unless what you do for God is done inside the mother church, you can never, ever, 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 ever expect to go to heaven. Never. It'll never happen. That's their power base. And they're not about to let go of that anytime soon. So here we have Bible Christianity. Bible Christianity says you can get saved anytime, anyplace, anywhere, under any conditions. All you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. And so God wants to free people from this. And really, I want you to listen to this. Because I know where I'm going at the end of this. I believe that God wants people to be free. I believe he does. There is a woman in the Bible that even though she was cast away, God was making her free. I want you to see where we're going with this. Okay? This is not the Mike Hoggard hates Arabs broadcast. This is not it. This is the Mike Hoggard Bethel Church loves people that God loves and wants to save. And I want to show people the truth so that they can be saved. But she, she wants to keep everything a big secret, a big mystery. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 7. She's called the strange woman. You ever met one of those? I have. She's called the strange woman. And um, she is a harlot. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. She's characterized this way. And she loves to allure people into her ways, into her domination, into her, little, into her little pit where she can keep them all nice and safe and very, 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 very hot. That's what she loves to do. And I want you to, we're going to move into some symbols here in a little bit. And I want you to kind of read the scriptures and kind of get where we're going so I don't have to come right out and say, this is blah. I don't want to do that. I want you to read the scriptures and understand. What is it about a woman that has to do with harlotry? Let's look at the scriptures. Proverbs chapter 7. Verse 7, Beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. because he wasn't reading his Bible. Passing through the street near her corner. And he went in the way to her house. In the, look at that word, twilight. Hmm, think about that for a minute. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. I want you to think now about something in Mecca that is black. Are you there yet? We're getting there. Okay, something that's black in in Mecca. I want you to think about that and what what really what black represents in the Bible. Okay, think about think about white and think about black. Think about the opposites and what they represent in the scriptures. And then in verse 10 it says, "And behold, there met him a woman with the entire of an harlot and subtle of heart. Let me stop right here. Did you did you get the wording here? She has the attire of a harlot and she is subtle in heart. Now the serpent is more subtle because the serpent and her love to just kind of work together. They're very subtle. The, the teachings, the, the things that are going on in the Christian church right now, they didn't just show up overnight. Some guy didn't just show up to a fundamental Bible-believing church said, okay, we're going to teach you guys how to meditate and how to contact familiar spirits. That's not what happened. They bring it in one word at a time in Sunday school literature or a, a small change in a translation. One thing at a time, very subtly and very 
slowly. This has been going on for years. Those who have been watchmen have seen it go on and have decided to just stay with the old Bible, the old King James. But she loves to work subtly. And then in verse 22, He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Then look at verse 24. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. That's that's where her house is. That's where she lives. That's where she is. The inside of her, literally, literally, is hell. Now, I want you to think about a mystery. We talked about the mystery of the man of sin. And where, where right now is the man of sin according to the Bible? The Bible says that he is in the pit. Well, did you know that the mouth of a strange woman in the book of Proverbs is a deep pit? Okay, and so the beast is in the pit. He is he is hidden. He has revealed all these masonic images, like of a coffin and things that are covered up and so on. That is an image of something that's down in the pit. Revelation thirteen, he rises up out of the sea. Revelation seventeen, he comes out of the pit. Revelation chapter nine, the key to the bottomless pit. The key is taken by the star that falls and it's opened up. And this king, Revelation nine eleven, comes rising up out of this pit. That is the Antichrist. And her job is to conceal him so that no one finds out his true identity. Are you with me? I'm going to take you to a story that picturizes this or pictorializes this back in the book of Genesis chapter 31. You remember Rachel? You remember Jacob fell in love with Rachel and he married her, but he had to marry Leah first. Then he falls in love and he marries Rachel and now he has Rachel and Leah to be his wives. And then Laban treats him bad and he has to leave. So he takes uh, Rachel and Leah and Bill and Zilpah and all the children. He takes them away from Laban. But there was something that Rachel was that was a, a, a well-kept secret. Rachel was an idol worshiper. And I want you to think about a woman. And I want you to think about a woman in her uncleanness. I want you to think about the, the way the Bible will describe certain things for you and the pictures that God draws. Remember, there is no new thing under the sun. That which was is that which shall be. And God shows us things. So Rachel stole her father's images, her, her, his, her dad's statues, her, his idols. She stole them to carry them with her because secretly she was an idol worshiper. And I want you to notice this because Laban catches up with Jacob and says, uh, how come you stole my idols? And Jacob said, well, I'll tell you this. Nobody among my clan did. And I'll tell you this, that whoever... whoever they're found with, I'll kill them. Okay, that's just simple as that. So Laban begins to do a search. He searches Leah's tent. He searches all the children's. He searches every place. But then he goes to probably his darling, his darling daughter, Rachel. He goes in unto her, and he's going to search for the idols. Notice Genesis chapter 31, verse 34. Now Rachel had taken the images and put them in the camel's furniture and sat upon them. I want you to get the imagery here that the Bible is trying to portray. She has taken that which is evil and wicked and sinful and she's put it in something and she's closed the lid and she has concealed it. She sat upon them. But there's something more to the story. And Laban searched all the tent and found them not. And she said to her father, Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise up before thee. For the custom of woman, or the custom of women is upon me. And he searched, but found not the images. Now, I, I just, you know, just kind of think about this the custom of women. She is in her, her time, as it were. And according to the scriptures, she now is an unclean woman. And she is sitting upon the camel's furniture, and she is concealing the image, the false god, the idol shepherd. Do you see that imagery there? 
She is mystery. Ba Here is mystery Babylon in the form of Rachel, and Rachel is not only a thief, but she's concealing the man of sin whom she secretly worships, and she's doing so in her uncleanness. Let's look at the law, because the law loves to reveal things. The law is probably one of the hardest things in the whole Bible to read, other than those genealogies. And we read the law and we go, what in the world? You may not understand it all. There's no lawyer that understands everything about American law or tax law. But you get one piece at a time and you go, I understand now. Leviticus chapter 15. Here is the law concerning a woman who was in the manner of women, in her custom of women, in that time. Here is the law concerning that. Leviticus 15, 26. Every bed whereupon she lieth all the days of her issue shall be unto her as the bed of her separation. And whatsoever she sitteth upon shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her separation. Did you? Are you getting that? She has, she has sat upon the camel's furniture, thus sitting upon, thus the unclean part of her body, sitting upon the furniture, making it unclean, the unclean part of her body, covering and concealing the Antichrist, the idle shepherd. This is a, I'm going to show you a picture. You're going to see this because this Bible says it all. It has the answer to everything. Take a look at this. This is like the official symbol for the kingdom of Europe, the European Union. Here is a woman, and she's sitting upon a beast, Revelation chapter 17. And according to what we see here with Rachel, she's an unclean woman. She's a harlot woman. Think of the imagery associated with this, the uncleanness. Here's an unclean, an unclean beast now. She, everything, and, and the Bible says in Revelation 17 that she sitteth upon seven mountains. You know what she's just done? She's made every one of them unclean. She has, she has unpurified, she has dirtied, she has soiled everything that she sits upon and everything that she dominates, she makes it into something dirty. It's no wonder. It's no wonder that out of the mouths of preachers nowadays is coming uncleanness. It's no wonder that we're seeing sermons and, and illustrations and jesting going on inside of the church that is absolutely filthy. It's no wonder. Because every place her spirit is, there is going to be uncleanness. And here she is sitting upon this beast. By the way, news article came across my desk last week. $600,000 the United States government spent on this. This is in a new part of the Pentagon. And they wanted some nice sculptures. So here they have a woman riding a beast. Uh, uh, actually, it's a frog. Why a frog? Because one of the vials of wrath that God pours out in the last days that these spirits, like unclean frogs, come out of the mouth of the beast and the false prophet. Okay? Wow! And we paid for it. Aren't you, don't you just feel glad that your tax dollars are at work buying idols of that which was is that which shall B. Now, let's go to the next step. And we have, we have dealt with this symbolism before here. The Watchman video broadcasts, other things. And let me, let me get uh, this uh, un, un, let, me, <laughs> let me get this unclean Bible here. This symbol here that I started out years ago wanting to know what this symbol meant. The symbol of the Triketra. Um, it has three shapes in it called a mandorla. The mandorla, and of course they uh, they say now you know the mandorla symbol is a you know is a picture of the Trinity you know showing that they are three and yet one and yet the Book of Acts says that uh, you know that you're not supposed to uh, you know engrave an image or a symbol of the Godhead Father Son Holy Ghost you're not supposed to do it and they said oh yeah yeah well, that's what we did that's what it is remember symbolism symbolism says that what we tell you about the symbol is a lie and we're not really going we're not going to tell you the truth she's sitting here and she's covering it up 
and it's unclean. I should not be touching the unclean thing here. But that's what that means. This symbol... Here it is up on the screen. This symbol is called the mandorla. And we see it like as the fusion of opposites, uh, you know, things like that. And, and it's amazing that the all-seeing eye just happens to look like that exact same symbol. I don't think that's any accident. So here we have this symbol. And, you know, just very briefly, it has everything to do with what we've been talking about. We're talking about harlot women and their uncleanness and that particular part of a, of a woman's body. That's what that symbol represents. So it represents concealment. It represents something that is hidden. It represents, and, and the Bible actually calls that the, the private parts. Okay? We're not supposed to see that. We're not supposed to be looking upon that. That's why pornography is so powerful. Because it represents something that we know, that God said, you're not supposed to be looking upon that. That's, that's the imagery there that, that we have here. That is the image of mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So it represents concealment. It represents mystery. It represents uh, uncleanness is what it represents. So I, I want you to get that. Um, this is... A mural. You ever heard of the United Nations Security Council? These are the men that are safeguarding the security of planet Earth against all enemies, you know, alien and, and domestic. Um, when the Security Council meets, they meet in front of this. Okay? That, I, I wonder... See, it doesn't take a, a, a rocket scientist and it doesn't take a biblical scholar genius who knows Hebrew and Greek to understand what spirit then is guiding. So the United Nations gathers and the Security Council and they says, uh, yeah, this Muammar Gaddafi, uh, he's got to go uh, and it's not working out how we wanted. So we're going to send in troops. What spirit? What spirit is God? And by the way, let's think about this, okay? Because we're going to deal with this. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi, according to you know most Muslims, most Arab Muslims in the Middle East, he's not Muslim enough. Neither, neither was Saddam Hussein. Neither was Hosni Mubarak. And they're all out of the picture right now. They just weren't Muslim enough. And so the Security Council meets in front of this image. And here we have, I want you to look at this now. Oh boy, here we have a, a, some kind of man handing apples to this little girl. Fruit out of a tree. Isn't that interesting? And we have a man and a woman, and they have their arms interlocked. That's, that's showing, you know, coming together. And um, the father's other hand is pointing to a child. A child that's going to come, a child of peace and harmony and safety for all men. A child of peace and safety that is going to be birthed. And you have the imagery of the, of the stork or the pelican. That is an ancient occult Rosicrucian symbol of the Antichrist. And so here we have this imagery here. The United Nations Security Council meets in front of this. So it doesn't take a genius to understand what spirit guides their decisions. Here we have the symbol of the Tricatcher. We talked about that. That's the cover of the New King James Bible. The secret in the movie National Treasure was always associated with this. It was hidden by this particular spirit. And what, Now, remember this. In, in National Treasure, this symbol represented a secret that she was hiding where? Down below. And it was in a church that was hiding the secret down below. This is Rachel and her uncleanness covering up the images. That's exactly what this symbol represents. Here is, uh, and I remembered, I, you know, I pulled some of this stuff out from my earlier studies, like from the Da Vinci Code. Here is, uh, this is in England, this is the chalice well. Okay, you know, the idea of the blade and the chalice, the up pointing thing and the down pointing thing. This is what this is, and notice they mark this chalice. Now, here's, here's something interesting. The, the myth is that Joseph of Arimathea, standing at the base of the cross, had a cup in his hand, just happened to have a golden goblet in his hand, and he's capturing blood that came out of Jesus' body. He then escapes to England. He's being chased because he has the Holy Grail with the blood of Christ in it. And then he takes it and he casts it down into this well. That's why they call it the chalice well. And for some reason, for some reason, take a look at the imagery here. The water that comes out of this well has a reddish hue to it. Like, like blood. The symbol... And the color red 
goes with the idea, this is her in her uncleanness concealing a secret. And people go here and they they drink the water because they think it has magical healing properties. They think that what's coming up out of this pit here that she's covering in her uncleanness, they think that's going to give them new life. People get married here, perform the sacred ritual. We understand what's going on now, don't we? This is Mystery Babylon in her uncleanness. And boy, does she love bling and money. I mean, look at it. She loves bling and she loves money. And that's why you'll see, that's why you'll see this symbol. Okay? She is in charge of governmental powers. Uh, we featured this several times. The two circles joined together, forming the mandorla, and there we have the, the what's called Baal's shaft, the obelisk. Uh, joining in with that. It's the fusion of male and female. And it's actually giving birth to something. Maybe it's a new world order. Maybe it's a child. Maybe she's concealing something here that one day will be, will be revealed because God said in Second Thessalonians, then shall that wicked be revealed. It's going to happen one of these days, and I, th I think it could happen very soon. I'm going to show you a clip. Um, the first time I saw this movie, I didn't get it. I, I went back and watched it again, and I went, oh, wow. There was a movie called What Dreams May Come. Really bizarre thing. This guy ends up going to hell to save his wife, and blah, blah, blah. But he's dead, and he doesn't know he's dead. He is sort of in a house that's, that's kind of got him trapped. Cuba, this is uh, Robin Williams, and Cuba Gooding Jr. reveals something to him that he's really trapped and he can be free. He just needs to make himself free. And I want you to see how this is done in the imagery that's done in this movie called What Dreams May Come. Take a look. Get out and walk away. Well, it looks like I rebuilt. Huh? You see a body because you like seeing one. We're seeing what we choose to see. Let me show you something. You don't need it anymore. This is your world now. <laughs> Did you see that? This this was done on purpose. I mean, he could have made a doorway. He could have made a window. He could have just busted a hole in there. No, he drew the mandorla, pushed it out. So now his new birth can take place. Now it can be revealed the world that he now lives in. We're seeing images of the Antichrist anywhere. And, and I mentioned Roman Catholicism earlier. Roman Catholicism loves this symbol. I'm here to tell you they put this symbol everywhere in their ancient artwork. Uh, and usually inside the Mandorla symbol is uh, like the Virgin Mary here. Or you usually have images of Christ who is who is being, con the real Jesus that they don't want you to know about is being concealed inside of this symbol. Understand that Roman Catholicism is not Bible Christianity. It is, by its very nature, a mystery religion. The doors, the entryways of all of these Gothic cathedrals, let's go back to our Da Vinci Code study. These Gothic cathedrals were designed by the Knights Templar, they're the ones that were funding them. They were the ones that were building them. And these Gothic cathedrals, these Roman Catholic cathedrals, were all designed to be a model of something. They were designed to be the model of a, of a womb, of, of a woman. Okay? 
um, mystery woman because everything they do in there is a mystery and and they conceal really what the truth is. Roman Catholicism does not preach the true gospel. Don't believe Chuck Colson. Don't believe Hank Hanegraaff. Don't believe any of these people who are telling you that oh, the Roman Catholics they just believe a lot of the same things we do. They just you know differences in doctrine. Yeah, they're idol worshippers. Come on, people. They don't. They're not teaching the real true gospel. Their gospel is hidden. It's secret. It's a mystery. And so <clears throat> their church buildings are wombs. So the entryway into these buildings is the mandorla. And there's usually three of them. It like the, makes like the triketra symbol. And you can see here that this mandorla doorway... Now, uh, uh, let me stop right here and so you to understand the imagery here of what, why Roman Catholics say that whatever you do for God has to be done inside the Roman Catholic Church. Roman Catholic funerals are never done in a funeral home, to my knowledge. They're almost always done inside the Catholic Church. Why? Because they call it the, the, the Mystery Mother Church. <clears throat> you go in the doorway... Now you have now you're in the womb. And now a ritual is going to be performed on you. Water is going to be sprinkled upon you, or you're going to be married, or you're going to receive the office of priesthood, or you're going to eat the cookie that they say is that's really Jesus. It tastes like Jesus, doesn't it? And you're gonna you're gonna drink this chalice with this blood red wine in it. And it's real wine too, okay? It's not the it's not the non alcoholic stuff. It's real wine in there, and they feed you that, and they perform these rituals, including marriage, including last rites at a funeral. <clears throat> and then you're brought out the doorway. Now, now you're now you're now you're born again. But see, really, when they perform the last rites on you, you're you're still dead. That's what the man of sin is all about. The king of the bottomless pit. He's dead. He is dead. And that's what that imagery is. And, and, and so here, Roman Catholicism, they don't hardly do anything without this symbol being present. The symbol of concealment, mystery, and, and uncleanness. Is the Roman Catholic Church clean or unclean? That's her secret. Whatever she sits upon, she makes it unclean. And by the way, remember, Roman Catholicism and Buddhism and New Ageism and all the other isms, they all really point to the same God, including Islam. This is what you'll find on most mosques, not all of them, most of them. You must enter into the mosque through her. And then you perform the ritual, and then you come out of her, and you have been given new life and rebirth and all. I mean, th think about what's going on. There really is no new thing under the sun, and it includes the religion of Islam. Proverbs 4.14, the Bible says, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Don't, don't go in there. Don't. I've attended maybe... Two Catholic funerals in my lifetime, and I have no real interest of ever going back into one of those churches ever again. I can tell you I have no interest in going in a mosque. I know that. I have no interest in going in there. I don't want to enter into the path of the wicked and go not in the way. I don't want to go in the way of evil men. Remember, her way and her path leadeth down to hell. That's what her pathway is. We featured this commercial for the uh, the Harry Potter, you know, amusement park down in uh, Orlando, Florida. And here again, the language of symbolism. You, I watched this, knowing what a broom represented. The broom in witchcraft. You know what it was? It was a phallus symbol. Okay, okay. That's why the woman was. Here we have the woman writing. The beast. That's what that imagery is. By the way, I got something better than that. God said in Isaiah, oh, I love this, because everything's in the Bible. God said in Isaiah, and I don't have the verse here in front of me, it just came to me. God said that all the wicked people in the world, he was going to sweep them with the besom, that's a broom, of destruction. Guess who that broom is? Okay, it's the beast. She's writing the beast, the broom. So here it is, the Harry Potter amusement park. Here's the commercial. 
And I want you to look at the imagery here, starting from the very, very beginning. I'm going to show you the entire commercial, and I want you to look at it from the very beginning and see the imagery here. Take a look. Coming this spring, you can truly be part of Harry Potter's world, where magic becomes real and excitement awaits at every turn. Explore the wizarding world of Harry Potter, a world of magical new adventures only at Universal Orlando Resort, where you can be courageous, be outrageous, be extraordinary. First of all, you have you have the owl. Remember the owl? Remember when we talked about Jared Loeffner and Lilith? That mystery and the Baba and the Bohemian Grove? The owl is an imagery of Lilith, mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. The owl is very secretive and a, and a creature of the darkness. By the way, owls don't eat bread. They don't eat crackers and cookies. They don't eat seeds. Owls eat flesh. They love carnal things. That's what an owl represents, a raven or a vulture, anything like that. Things that God said don't eat. Uh, eagles, don't eat eagles. Why? Because they have carnal appetites. Stay away from them. And so anyway, here's this owl, Mystery Babylon the Great. That's, that's signifying to you that there is a mystery here. And then you see Harry Potter on, on his broom and the children. He says, come and follow me. We have seen a disaster take place in this country and around the world because here Jesus beckons all the children, come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Harry Potter is the replacement Christ who says, come follow me. And then you see them on their brooms. And what are they flying into? They're not flying into, you know, like a cottage, you know, like Hansel and Gretel where the witch lived. They're flying into the mandorla, the womb. Come follow me. And learn magic so we can be reborn. She is concealing a secret and a mystery here in the last days. Now, I spoke of Mecca. What is it, what is it that's in Mecca? What is it that drives billions of people all over the world, mostly Arabs, mostly, mostly children of Ishmael? What drives them? What is so powerful there in Mecca? And remember we talked about that her way represents darkness and blackness. What is it that's black inside of Mecca? It's called the Kaaba. In Islam, this is interesting. This is really, really interesting to me. There is no new thing under the sun and everything matches the Bible. Islam has five pillars. One, two, three, four, five. I will ascend into heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Revelation chapter 9. The fifth trumpet sounds. The key comes down, and it's going to unlock the pit. What's been revealed, what's been concealed, is now going to be revealed. And Islam just happens to have five pillars, five, <clears throat> five laws. Five laws, five books in the Old Testament called the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All five of them were written by the lawgiver Moses, and they describe the law of God. That if you cannot obey the law, then you'll die. And so Islam is like an image of that. They have five pillars. One of them is, you have to bow down five times a day facing this black box and you have to pray. And if you don't do that, you cannot go to paradise. You have to make what's called a hajj. That's why all these people are here. They're making their hajj, their pilgrimage. They must go to Mecca. I think it's at least once, once in their life. They must go to Mecca. They must compass the Kaaba. Something that has a black veil over it, something that most people will never ever see the inside. Only, only, only like the elite of the Muslims, only like the elite of the Arabs, the, the rich ones, the high-ranking um, priests or whatever it is, only those guys can go inside and see what really is in there. And I'm going to show you some things that are in there. Now remember, and this goes back to some other videos that we've done. Um, and an Iranian uh, president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, is called a Twelver. What is a Twelver? 
Islam believes that there is coming a Messiah, someone who is going to save them. There was just recently released, and I, and I don't think it was a hoax either, a 30-minute video produced by, uh, by Iranians in favor of Ahmadinejad and in favor of what it is that he wants to do. What is it, what is it that he wants to do? He wants to you know, kill all the Jews and burn Jerusalem down to the ground so they can have the whole thing. That's what he wants to do. And, uh, and so anyway, why does he want to do this? Because Ahmadinejad believes in what's called the 12th Imam, the Mahdi. A resurrected Mahdi who used to live, oh, about 15, 1600 years ago, and is, he's not up here coming down, he's down in a pit. He's in a well, like a chalice well. And he is concealed inside of that. And there are certain signs in Islam, according to the Quran, according to some of their sacred writings, that reveal to Muslims. And this 30-minute video was produced to really stir up and hype people, kind of like these billboards all over the country where it says, hey, the world's going to end May 21st, get ready. By the way, I'll be preaching a conference May 21st um, in uh, Bristol, Virginia. Uh, looking forward to that. So I'm really not planning on going anywhere but Bristol, Virginia on May 21st. But, you know, that's up to the Lord. But anyway, they're trying to stir everybody up in the Arab world to tell them that the Mahdi is coming. He's going to rise up out of the pit, the well, and he's going to take over the world for Islam. And we need to prepare. So we need to go ahead and bomb Jerusalem you know, so we can bring him forward. That's, that's what they're concealing. That's what this Kabah is all about. Now, the interesting thing, let's go back to this picture here. The Kabah is a cube, okay? It's not an oval. It's not anything. We'll get to the oval in a minute. The Kabah is a cube. And then I saw that, and I'm going... I've read something on that. So I checked with Manley Hall. He's dead now, but he wrote a book called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. And Manley Hall said, and Dan Brown spoke of that in The Lost Symbol, too. It's how I remembered it. He said the cube, basically, it's a, it's a secret mystical symbol. Number one, it represents a number. And it's not the number four. It represents the number six. That's how many sides it has on. When you play a game... Um, you know, gambling. You play a game called dice. What are they? The little cubes with numbers on them. With numbers one through what? Six. And you roll the dice out there and your fortune. Now get this. This is like throwing pennies into a well and making a wish, hoping that the God that's down in that well will grant you your wish. This idea of throwing dice. And I, you know, I play Monopoly. I play, tr I love trouble. Ding, ding. I love that game. It's got dice. I don't think that's sending anybody to hell. But I want you to get this idea, that especially with gambling, okay? They throw the dice and your fortune is bound up inside of that cube with the number six on it. Six. Six is Genesis six. Sons of God, three words. And daughters of men, three words. Fused together, the Mandorla. That's what that, and his number is 603 score and 6. So 6 is a very powerful number in the occult. It shows the fusion of God with man. Remember the mystery of godliness? God was manifest in the flesh. There are six things there showing you that God, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us, and it was fully God and fully man. The opposite of that is sons of God, daughters of men. They, Daniel's fourth kingdom, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And so the cube is a mystical representation of that fusion process taking place, which there we get the Mandorla symbol. But Manly Hall said something else about the, uh, the cube. He said if you have a, a box that's a cube and you take it and you flatten it out, it makes a cross. What is a cross a symbol of? Our chromosomes. Our chromosomes are, are, are the containers of a secret. The DNA. The book. And in this case, in our flesh, it's a closed book. The two serpents twined together represent uh, the mystery of the Antichrist rising up in the last days. And so the Kaaba is a picture of the Antichrist concealing him. One of these days it's going to be revealed 
who he really is. But then let's go one step closer. There was a, there was actually a YouTube video, and I'm surprised I could see this. Um, someone took a video of inside the Kaaba. Notice that it's supported by three pillars. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Genesis chapter 3, Then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Three things there. Man of sin. Three crosses numbered with the transgressors. These three pillars represent the man of sin. There was something else. As the camera panned around to one wall inside the Kaaba, there it is on the wall, a symbol of the sun, and underneath it, a symbol of the moon. Now, I want to stop right here because this is what I think is, is ironic. Muslims are very proud of the fact that they don't worship idols. Yeah, they do. The Kaaba is one big gigantic idol. And inside the Kaaba, the symbols of the sun and the moon, God said you'd be driven to worship them. And that's exactly what they do. They, most people don't know it, but that's exactly what they're doing. They're worshiping the images of the sun and the images of the moon. And the sun and the moon represent polar opposites that are fused together, the male and the female, light and darkness, yin and yang, sons of God, daughters of men. That's what that symbolism is. But, but, and, and the guy from Canada sent me this, and I'm trying not to use names, you know, but he sent me this and he said, uh, Pastor Hogger, take a look at these two pictures. And I went, yeah, yeah, I get that. I, I understand what that is. Mystery Babylon the Great. The mother of harlots. She's an unclean woman. Uh, she is to be implanted with seed. And she is going to give birth one of these days. I get the imagery here. But there's something else. Something else that is a great big gigantic mystery uh, in Islam. The mystery of Mecca. The mystery of the Kaaba. What, what is it really? It's something that, from what I understand, I've never been there, of course, you know, uh, but I think that most everybody that goes there can actually see this. They just don't really know exactly what it is. In, in Mecca, and I've always heard this, <clears throat> and I didn't really know, you know, exactly how it was placed there, but in the Kaaba, there's supposedly a, a, a black stone. A black stone. Um, let me let me read a verse here. Um, in Revelation chapter 2, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the hid manna, and will give him a white stone. The black stone in the Kaaba would be the exact opposite of Christ, the white stone. Remember opposites here. Remember, remember uh, the strange woman conceals... In blackness. The whole Kaaba is black. That thing's changed every year, I think. And then uh, then you have the black stone. And watch this now. Supposedly, the black stone, some speculate it's a meteorite, it, it fell from the heavens. It, it fell. And it's a symbol for Allah or Muhammad or something like that. But... If Jesus then is the white stone that he gives to us who overcome in the last days, who then would be the black stone? It's the beast, the Antichrist. And, and I'm going to show you how the black stone is displayed in the Kaaba. Take a look at this. Now compare it with that. I saw it, it took me a second and a half, and I said, I get it. I understand. Mystery Babylon the Great in her uncleanness, concealing the man of sin, awaiting a birth of a new world order in the last days. They truly have a secret, a very diabolical deadly, dangerous secret. Okay? Now, 
do I believe that uh, the Muslim, the, the New World Order is the Muslim world taking over planet Earth? No, because I think it's bigger than that is what I think. I think that all of the religions that are leading in this same direction, you know, you have Islam here, you have Roman Catholicism here, you even, you even have, you even have um, what we call Orthodox Judaism, they're following the Kabbalah. They're all pointing in the same direction. Uh, the New Age movement, the Mormon Church, the New Ecumenical movement with contemplative prayer, all of them are being, remember, Mystery Babylon, Isis, her husband Osiris was cut in parts. She's working on joining the pieces back together so that the birthing can take place, so that her husband can live again. And I'm telling you, it is an absolute, uh, this, is, this is big, okay, this is big. And I, I, I want to show you something that it's, how, how can I explain this? Because I put two things together that I think the Lord wanted me to end with this particular teaching here because I really think, I really think the greatest work of God on this earth is yet to come. I'm not talking about a new cross, a new Jesus. I'm not talking about anything like that. I'm talking about the greatest move of God inside the hearts of men is yet to come. We don't have to just assume that just because we're in the last days, nobody's getting saved anymore. I think the Bible's teaching something entirely different. Remember when, um, when we went to, uh, when things were going on in Egypt, and we went to Isaiah chapter 19. And Isaiah chapter 19, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading that. I want you to read that. But he talks about, in, in Isaiah 19, 4, And the Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a cruel lord, and a fierce king shall rule over them. Guess who that is? It's the black stone. It's the Mahdi that's going to rise up out of the well. That's who that is. But you read, continue reading. In the, Isaiah chapter 19, you will see that God has a mighty salvation both for Egypt and and Assyria to the north, and they become one of like three places and three cities, Assyria, Egypt, and Jerusalem, where God's people or where Jesus himself is going to reign from. I think that, I think that the seed of Ishmael, and, and the, the interesting thing about Islam, something I do know, the interesting thing about Islam is that um, they say that the covenant was actually given to, to them through Abraham, through Ishmael, and not Isaac. That's, that's what they think. Okay, I'm going to show you the covenant that God made with Hagar and Ishmael. I'm going to show you from the Scriptures. And wouldn't it be great? A billion Arabs in this world, I'm just guessing, I don't know how many there are, and almost all of them following the exact same religion. God promising them that a cruel Lord is going to come over them. The Messiah that they're looking for is not going to be their buddy. He's going to be a cruel authority over them. And what does God, how does God use cruel authority? He, in the book of Judges, God put Israel constantly under cruel authority. Why? To get them to cry out unto the Lord. And God would always send them a Savior. You see, God is listening to the earth to hear those who cry out unto him. God is listening for that. And I'm going to show you something that I see, that I, I think I see it very clearly from the Scriptures. This may not match our patriotism here in America because of 9-11. This may not be politically correct. But I think God has a great salvation awaiting the seed of Ishmael. They are the children of Hagar. Genesis chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. So we know that she's an Egyptian. She's a, in Egypt is always a type of the world and type of very you know, terrible people. Genesis chapter 16, verse 15. And Hagar bare Abram a son. And Abram called his son's name Hagar, which Hagar bare Ishmael. This is the seed, the child of Abraham. Now, I know, I know that it's not the lineage that Christ came from. I know that it's the, and according to Paul in Galatians chapter 4, she is a bondwoman, so therefore those who are born 
under her are born into bondage. God used that in, in Galatians to be a type even of Israel who was born by Mount Sinai and are in bondage right now. If God can save the Jews, he can save anybody. And I want you to get that in your mind. In chapter 17 of the book of Genesis, the Bible says, And Ishmael his son was how many years old? Thirteen years old. Remember Mystery Babylon the Great? Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's 13 words here. And it, the number 13, I love this. The number 13 has to do with love. Okay? Um, the love chapter, the charity chapter in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, the phrase, love of God, guess how many times that's in the King James Bible? 13. Okay? When Jesus walks around with 12 disciples, how many are there? There's, there's 13. And Jesus represents the pure love of God. For God so loved the world that he, that he gave His only begotten Son. That's what that number 13 points to. The opposite of that is impure, unclean love, as in harlot love. Are you getting where I'm going here? So here is Ishmael, and he's 13. And he was born of a bond woman, a slave. And yet God gave Abraham a he said, Abraham, I want you to do something. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a, a, a token, a sign of my promise. And God never breaks his promise. He said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a, a token of my promise. The promise was the coming of Jesus Christ to be the Savior. The token was circumcision. Genesis 17, and Ishmael his son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the self same day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael his son. I know they're not, I know they're not Israel. I know that they are children of bondage. I know that they were cast out. But the token is there. The token of God's salvation is there. I see this. Let's move on. Romans chapter 4 verse 11, the Bible says he received the sign of circumcision. And what is that? A seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. Remember, Islam is built upon five laws, five rules, five pillars. And if you don't do this, you're, you're going to go to hell if you don't do these five things. You know, if you don't pray to Mecca five times a day, you're out. That's the, that's the same law that Israel was under. If you coveted after one thing, you're dead. Okay, You will go to hell forever. That's the law. But Ishmael and Abraham received the seal of God's grace through faith, which Abraham had even before he was circumcised. So that he might be the father of all them that what? Believe, though they be not circumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham. Stop right here. The Muslims, the Arab Muslims, point back to who? Abraham. I think things are adding up. They don't know it yet. They don't get it yet. But I think that God is going to reveal something to them after they've been under the authority of the, the probably the 12th imam, their cruel authority. I think God has a salvation for them. So he says, But who also walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans 15, 8. Now I say to, that Jesus Christ was a minister of who? Of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles 
with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. Philippians 3.3, 3, for we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Right now, the Arabs, the sons of Ishmael, have confidence in their flesh. That's why they blow up buildings and fly planes and stuff. That's why they killed themselves for the great Allah. That's why they don't have a problem with the death. And they have so much confidence in their flesh that they teach that if you are defiled by something unclean, like a pig or something like that, if you don't wash, man, and, and, and in Islam, they're so superstitious that if you touch a, a pig or something made from pork and you die that way, you're going to hell. No redemption for you. You have to watch. And they have confidence in their flesh right now. I, I think God is going to bring them to a place where they have no confidence in their flesh. You see where I'm going here? Back to Genesis chapter 21. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, this is Sarah. This was according, this was according to the will of God. She said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. Now God was showing this to show that the lineage of Christ was going to come through Isaac and not through Ishmael. But I'm going to show you Something that God did for the woman that was cast out. Okay? So he said in verse 13, And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. He is the seed of Abraham, he is their father, and they have been circumcised. Genesis twenty-one fourteen. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took, did you notice the symbols here, bread, and a bottle of water, and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. You know what the Bible says about bread and water? Isaiah 30, And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more. But thine ears shall see thy teachers, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left, ye shall defile also. Look at this. Ye shall defile also the covering of thy graven images of silver, and the ornament of thy molten images of gold. Thou shalt cast them away as a what? A menstruous cloth, thou shalt say unto it, Get thee hence. Everything that we've seen so far, I think it's telling us the great salvation that God has for some people who have been rejected and cast out. And they've been given the bread of affliction and the water of adversity. And yet God is going to call them one of these days. And the unclean covering, the kabah, the symbol that's there and what she's concealing, that's going to be cast away as a menstruous cloth. And God's going to call some people out. Genesis 21. The water was spent in the bottle. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs, and she went and sat her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. Look at verse 17. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven, and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not. For God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. Did you know that that is exactly the same words that God promised to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12? Let me show you. 
Genesis 12, verse 2. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And remember, the number 12 is the number for God's promise. 12 tribes, 12 apostles. We have the promise on us as Gentiles, don't we? God said that Ishmael was going to be made a great nation. So look at this. He said, lift up the lad and hold them in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw what? A well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad to drink. John chapter 4, verse 13, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him. Exact same words. The King James Bible is the word of God, people. It's the exact same words. Give, I shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. I spent years being angry. And what happened in our country September 11th? Had to get over that. I started reading and started studying the Bible. And then I started having pity upon the bondwoman, Hagar. She had no control over what was done to her. Abraham just said, you know, Sarah said, do this, and this is what I'm going to do. And all of a sudden she has a child, and all of a sudden now she's hated. And she's cast out. And she almost dies. And she cries out unto the Lord. And God showed, God opened her eyes and revealed to her a well of water. That is Jesus. That is eternal life springing up. That's what that is. And she gave her lad to drink and he did live. And so she took him back to Egypt and he married a woman. And you know how many sons he had? Twelve. I think that there is a mighty salvation coming to the sons of Ishmael, the sons of Abraham, who right now have a menstruous cloth for a goddess and a black stone for a god, an idol, a silver idol. But I think one of these days, God's going to do something absolutely magnificent. After all, He's done it in my life, and hasn't He done it in yours? I think God has a mighty salvation awaiting the seed of Abraham, both in Isaac and in Ishmael. So we pray for God to save His people Israel. But can we not also pray for God to save the son of the bondwoman as well? Pray about it. Think about it. The mystery is going to be over. The mystery is going to be revealed. And I think there's some people out there who right now hate God are going to turn to Him in the last days. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. I thank you for listening to me. God bless you. We'll see you the next time. Bye-bye.